I'd like you to think for a moment about a great place to work. Think about the characteristics of a great place to work, your best day on the job. What kind of things come to mind? You know, what, do you, what are you thinking about? I'm seeing some, some smiles here. This is a good thing. That, that joy will evoke a little positive emotion here. Um, when you think about your best days on the job, for many of you, it's going to involve thoughts about the people that you serve. Maybe you're a teacher and in a classroom, or you're serving students who are going to go into classrooms, or you're, you're interacting. Maybe the kids are a little older than this. Maybe they're adults. Maybe they're online. When you think about the mission that draws you to education and the way you're able to serve that audience, that helps to engage us. When you think about interacting with colleagues and setting up, setting up examples for students to be able to, to build those relationships that matter to them and, and really um, interact in a meaningful way, it's, it's fabulous to think about that. It's engaging. It opens our mind. It creates positive emotions and, and moves us forward. It's not always like that. <laughs> Right? There's times when we're not engaged in our job, or unfortunately even actively disengaged in our job. I don't mean to pick on road workers here, but some of you haven't gotten it yet. If you look a little closer, you'll, you'll get the point. Um, there are days when we're not at our best. There are days when our colleagues are not at their best, where they might be a little bit off center. They might be a little bit negative. They might be a little bit down. And we need to figure out how we can create more days like our best days, so that instead of driving around it, you stop, get off, move the stick, and, and, and go on with your job. So um, it's ironic, though, that, that this kind of thing happens in every, in every industry. It happens in education as well. Um, I'm a, I'm a three-time champion of the Odo County Spelling Bee. You might not be, but you still understand there's something wrong with this picture, and we can, we can do better, right? Um, I hope that this has been discovered, painted over, and, and fixed. I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to think that it has anyway. But, so not every day is like our best day, but let's think about how we can create more days like that. So with Gallup Science, we've studied tens of millions of employees over the last several years, all around the world in all kinds of industries, workplaces, including education, and, uh, and a growing number in education, sell out stadiums full of people in education, to really think about what does it look like to be, to be in the workplace, and how can we group people together in different categories, and start to think about how we lead workplaces differently. So our research has, has really been boiled down to say, oversimplifying here, there's three different types of people in the workplace. There's those who are engaged in their job, who are always looking for more. They're the busiest people who can always take on more. They're great employees, and they're, and they're psychologically committed to the work they're doing. They have a heart connection to their job. They're proud of being an employee there. Then there's the not engaged employees, which is in the middle, right? So it's about half of most workplaces where they might be satisfied with their job, but it's more of a transactional relationship. I have a job description. I understand what it says. I follow through on everything in there. I get paid twice a month. I retire in eight years, life's good, you know, and, and from eight to five, Monday through Friday, they're, they're sufficient at their job, but they're not necessarily excellent at their job, and they stop at five, and sometimes the work doesn't stop at five, and they go home and don't think about work, and I'm not saying you have to be a workaholic, but those who are engaged in their job are always thinking about it, and they make those connections. It's about work-life integration, not work-life balance, and then unfortunately, there's those folks who, who kind of look down their nose and say, this won't work. They're active in their disengagement. If they were just not engaged, that'd be fine. We could, we could manage that and, and work our way through. But they're negative, and they're out recruiting additional negativity to join them. And so they're, they're out there and, and trying to pull other people down with them. So our goal is to figure out how can we move people up a step on that ladder of engagement and have more people having more of their best days every day. Um, when we look at the, at the data around the world, and, and particularly on this slide around the country, we find that 30% of the U.S. workforce is engaged, and I just described what that looks like. About half, 52% are in that holding pattern in the middle that are not engaged, and that leaves those 18% who are actively disengaged. Think about the number of employees at your institution or in your school district, and assume your average, I know you're all better than average, I mean, unfortunately, half of you aren't, because that's how the math works, but anyway, <laughs> um, maybe, maybe since you're here, you're above average, I don't know, I'm, and because you're standing between me and the door, but let's say 18% are actively disengaged. Think about how many employees that is that every day are coming in and potentially making things a little bit worse. Potentially grumbling at a student on the bus on, before the day's even officially started. You know, potentially hanging up the phone on a student who, who, before all their questions are answered. Or potentially not addressing the needs of a student who didn't quite get it that day and who really needs a little additional attention and advice. So, we really need to think about the impact one at a time. I love to think about big numbers and big data, but there's faces behind those numbers, and we really need to think one student at a time the impact we can have to create more Christinas in our future 
uh, for the good of all of our students. So there's this phenomenon. I've been at Gallup for 14 years, so I'm on the, I'm on the, the right-hand side. I've been at Gallup more than 10 years, so I'm, my engagement's you know, back up here. But there's something, this phenomenon about engagement in the workplace. When you start, there's this honeymoon effect. Life's good, right? And maybe I was unemployed, I said yes to the job, maybe I had a couple offers and I chose this one, so that's a good thing. So it's no surprise that we start at the most engaged level. One to three years in, it starts to tail off. It kind of hangs out down in the, in the bottom at three to five, creeps up a little bit at five to 10, and then really starts to recover by the time you're tenured, 10 years or more. Now, in higher education, if we're looking at tenured faculty, there's probably some relief that comes with that milestone, so maybe there's a, a more immediate bump, a more stated difference there in higher education, or in K-12 if you're, if you're a tenured teacher. There's, there's different milestones that probably help drive our engagement, but when I look at this, I think it doesn't have to be this way. I think about what is it about the first day on the job or the first year on the job that's fabulous. Well, my boss took me out for work, told me not to call her, her, call her a boss, but, but we're colleagues. Um, they gave me a clear job description and, and, and then explained what it really means. So there's the, the formal one and then there's the here's what we really expect. Um, people stopped by and built relationships. Somebody invited me over to dinner because they knew I moved here from out of town and all these kind of moments that matter in our early time in our career. How come we don't do those things three to five to 10 years with the same intentionality and regularity that, that we do with those newer employees? So I really just encourage you to help us reverse this trend and, and say that your first day on the job would be your least engaged and it's just up from there. I think that's possible. Um, just so you all don't think I'm a hypocrite, this is, a, this is an email that was in my inbox on Monday morning. Uh, Gallup is actually conducting our own internal Q12 survey right now, twice a year. We measure the engagement of all 2,000 or so Gallup employees. We report on that at a work group level and say, here's how engaged your team is. And then we go through each of those 12 items and say, get together, have a conversation, think about how you can take some ownership about your work group and about your team. You might be part of a great institution, a celebrated, you know, a celebrated school district or a wonderful nonprofit, whatever the case might be. What really matters, we found in our research, is the local manager, that local work group, is, this, is the job that you come to every day. You might be the most engaged school district in the world, but if your school, if your local school is not where it needs to be, that's the world you live in. So we need to think about how we can really wrap our arms around the local level and really drive some progress there. I call your attention to this middle section of the email here. It says, our research shows that engagement isn't any one point in time, but rather the many moments and relationships that make up your workday and the period of time the measurement spans. In other words, think back over the last six months, reflect on your engagement, and more importantly, think forward to the next six months and beyond and what you can do to drive engagement. Josh Starr said this morning that we should use data to drive decisions. He also said he's more interested in the interaction of people around those measures than the measure itself. What he meant to say was Gallup has the best measure of employee engagement ever known to man, and it's important that we do, right? That, can I edit that? Okay, thank you. Um, you'll need to go back to Twitter and make that edit as well, if you would. Um, so the measure matters, right? We need it to be a brief measure. You've all got surveys on campus that, that have 114 items and aren't actionable, and there's nothing you can do about it, but you have to take the survey anyway, and, and that kind of thing. So we need to get better about how we measure engagement, but we really need to get better about what we do with that information and how we make our, our daily work experience better as a result. Three takeaways as we wrap up the, the part of this around employee engagement. There's three, three main points from, we just released, if you're, if you're interested in a lot more about this, like 60 pages more about this, um, go to gallup.com and we've got the State of the American Workplace, which was just released. Um, Jim Harder is, uh, is here today and is gonna do a breakout session later. Literally wrote the book on employee engagement. Um, the 12 book is, and, and he's been our chief scientist about that. So he's a real heavy contributor to this research report. But the three takeaways that we have, I mean, first, let's figure out the right people to be managers. And here's a hint, it's not always the best teacher that makes the best principal. It's not always the best faculty member that makes the best dean. It's not always the best salesperson that makes the best sales manager or best recruiter that makes the best director of admissions and so on. Management requires a different set of talents than the job itself. Now, sometimes it's important to have been a teacher before you're a principal so that you understand the context and acquire the knowledge and skills but you're not gonna acquire the talent to manage. You probably have that or you probably don't. So let's figure out ways to celebrate those great employees and make the best teacher, the most hopeful teacher, as celebrated as the best principal in the district. And let's think about how we, how we reward that and recognize that and celebrate that in a different way. So I'd encourage you to think about who you name to be managers is critical. Second, let's think about employee development. 
If we were to look at the strengths of everybody in this room, and I'm, I'm sure we probably have, but at previous conferences like this, learner and input always show up near the top of the list. So I can get all the amens I want about the second point about employee development. Many of you are, are not on 12-month contracts, and you might be even, you know, this might be your summer break, and, you're, and you're, you're still here, right? And many of you took two or three days to show up and, and invest in this because there's some great mind candy and some great learning and development that happens as a result. We need to think about that for every employee, not just those who are wired with learner input as a talent. We all have that need to grow and know where we're headed and, and really be a part of the future. And then third, let's think about the strengths of each employee. One of the items on our Q12 survey is, at work I have the opportunity to do what I do best every day. Well, first of all, let's figure out what it is that I do best every day. What are my strengths? And then let's have a conversation with my manager about how can I do more of what I do best every day. Again, in, engagement is how involved with and enthusiastic are you about your job. It's easier to be enthusiastic about something you're good at and that you love to do and that you're connected to. So Don Clifton used to say there's cheers and there's chores, right? There's some things we love to do and some things we get to do anyway. So I'm not saying this is an excuse to cross out the parts of your job description you don't like, but I'm saying how can you spend more moments of your day focused on areas that you're good at focused on areas you're connected to the mission of and you believe you can make a difference around and how can we really drive that. But we've got to think about the kids, not just our own kids, but everybody's kids and how, how we can really move things forward in terms of education. Shane mentioned we surveyed a half a million kids last fall. We'll, we'll survey at least that many again this fall and, and ongoing. We made a commitment to offer the Gallup student poll free of charge to any public school district in the country that wants to sign up and participate in that. We don't charge a penny for it and we collect the data we provide grade level, school level reports back to the district. We'd love to have conversations with you about how to interpret that and so on. But those of you who are in K-12 school districts that are not signed up for the Gallup Student Poll, gallupstudentpoll.com, you can, you can sign up anytime. Those of you who live in a place where you're paying taxes for a local school district, I'd encourage you to think about the same thing for the schools in your area and how you might be able to create a conversation that taps into more of the constructs we start, we've been talking about throughout the day today. These are the five items we ask kids on the Gallup student poll that relate specifically to how involved with and enthusiastic they are about their school. Some of these are similar to our workplace items, but kids that have a best friend at school, boy, things really change. Um, we, we know that fifth graders are, are more engaged than some of their older counterparts. I believe part of that is because they've got the whole day with some of the same kids, and they've got more time. I mean, it takes time to build best friends for most people. I have woo, so if we meet, we'll be best friends in a minute. At least I'll think so. Um, I also have relator, so I'm not completely shallow. I've got depth that I can reach into if we need to, but you won't know that. If, you know, anyway, um, but it takes time to build those best friends. Let's think about how we can, in, in, can get kids to sit together and learn together and dissect pigs together and do these things together that really help draw out more of who they are. Safety matters. I mean, you've got to have that safety and security about your school day. And this doesn't just mean you know, metal detectors at the front door or, or something like that. I mean, that might be a part of it, but is a teacher creating a warm and safe environment? Is an advisor of a club in, or a fraternity house or something like that, are they creating a place that says, I feel safe here, this feels like home to me? Many of you have campuses where people don't identify that campus is home. How quickly can you build that community so they don't get homesick, go home at Christmas and never come back and end up on your, on your turnover report? My teachers make me feel my schoolwork is important. They've got to connect it to the relevance about the future. We've talked a lot about employment and why do we, why do we get an education and, and many people would say to get a good job. Well, how about why do I have to take this class? Well, let's make it about so that I can think differently about the future. Mary talked yesterday about how she brought her electric bill in to share with her students one time because they needed to see what a graph really looks like in real life. So it had the, the usage of electricity charted over the last 12 months or something. How can we come up with more relevant daily, everyday experiences, bring that into our classrooms throughout? At the school, I have the opportunity to do what I do best every day. We've talked a bit about that. You have your strengths on your name tag. Many of you have, have known about strengths and that. Strengths Finder is one amazing way to figure out how to, how to do more of what you do best every day. It's exciting. We've had nine million people take the assessment. It bums me out every day that probably eight million of them done nothing more with it than take the assessment. Don't be one of those. Um, be one of those people who sees StrengthsFinder not as the, the arrival point, now I know my strengths and life's all good. Have that be a starting point in a lifelong development process. I had conversations with Don Clifton a few months before he passed away, and he was still trying to figure out what significance means, and it was one of his top five themes. He wrote the stinking StrengthsFinder. If a guy doesn't understand, I mean, if Don Clifton spends his whole life thinking about this, and, and in the last few days of his life is still trying to be more of who he is, 
I think there's a, there's a lesson in that for us. Also had futuristic in his top five, which probably, probably played into that a bit. And then finally, at, in the last seven days, I've received recognition or praise for doing good schoolwork. Um, this can consistently is the lowest scoring item on our engagement survey with students and is among the lowest scoring items on our, on our employee engagement survey as well. We have this fear that people are going to get too much recognition, they're going to become complacent. I've personally never met anyone who struggles with too much recognition. Um, I'm not saying it needs to be a, a traveling trophy or an employee of the month award and everybody gets a turn. It needs to be meaningful and it needs to be personal and individualized. Figure out what's, ask an employee or a colleague, what's the best recognition you've ever received? And then think about how you can draw that in. It's important for us to be recognized in a way that's meaningful to us and individualized. Every kid ought to be, be able to get an A in something. To quote Tony from this morning, let's, let's have it be A, B, or still working on it. We're incomplete, right? And, and keep moving the bar forward about that. So Brandon mentioned this this morning, and, it, and it's scary to me because Liam is, is about to enter third grade and is at this high level of engagement. I mean, he is loving life, loving school, can't wait to learn and, and, and really get rolling with things for another semester, another year. Elementary school students, 76% are engaged. Then they leave elementary school and go to middle school. That's a very difficult transition, and many of you have done, had done some great work in that area. And the percent of engaged students drops all the way from 76 down 15 points, all the way down to 61%. And then it keeps going down, all the way down to high school. Now, those of you who work with freshman orientation programs, which I know there's, there's a few dozen of you in the room, you're getting students who are coming at a low point and a downward, and a downward trend. So if you wonder why freshman orientation and freshman retention is such a difficult task, it's because you've got to reverse that momentum that our, our system has somehow created. Now, this is not an excuse and it doesn't have to be this way. And we've got two years to fix it before Liam hits fifth grade and, and we start sending him through the Gallup student. I'm not selfish about this at all. Um, We've got some examples of fabulous high schools that have high hope and high engagement and high well-being, and they look statistically more like an elementary school than a middle school or a high school. So let's think about how we can reverse that trend. Let's study in higher ed. What does it look like? Are freshmen more engaged, and then it kind of trickles down, and maybe by senior year they, they pop back up? I don't know. We need to study that together and really, really think about what that looks like. And Chafee College and Frostburg and others are, are joining us in that kind of work. So... So why do we care about employee, or why do we care about student engagement? Well, we fixate too much in this time and age about student test scores. We've discussed that a bit throughout the day today. But let's just assume one of the many missions of education is to, to help students learn and achieve in, in an academic manner. Let's say we care about student achievement. Um, I think we can all agree on that. It's necessary but not sufficient in terms of a fabulous um, education system. So what drives student achievement? Well, student engagement drives student achievement. Dr. Gary Gordon, who will be in a, in a breakout session in a few moments here, um, has literally, again, written the book on school engagement and how student engagement drives student achievement. So then you should be asking, what drives student engagement? We can't just say, let's change a textbook every year and students will achieve more, or let's go teach harder, or you know, whatever the myth might be. How can we drive student engagement as a largely untapped resource in student achievement? Well, there's a few ways that we know that you can drive student engagement. One way is put them in elementary school and keep them there forever. Now, <laughs> Nebraska is not known for its cheap property taxes. I put about $4,000 a year into the local school system for our, our property taxes, and I don't want that to double by, by building smaller schools in, at the end of every street corner and that kind of thing. So there's a pressure about you know, the way that we've traditionally done school. I think we can challenge that model and draw from what's great about elementary school and replicate that throughout, but, but that's a real challenge. The number of students matters. If you've ever seen Little House on the Prairie, that was my school growing up. I grew up in a school about the size of this stage. Um, kindergarten, through, this was the entire school district. Kindergarten through eighth grade, a class one school, just about an hour's drive from here. Class size matters, the size of the school matters. I was the only student in my class most, most of my uh, seven years in that school, so, um, you know, that matters, but boy, the, again, it's a budgetary issue. It's not an easy problem to solve. But even in large lecture halls or even in large school districts, how can we create communities where students can have that sense of belongingness? How can we create student organizations in higher education that help students really get connected and be known by someone meaningful on campus? There's another one that's kind of ugly and hard to solve, right? Free and reduced lunch. Um, it matters whether you have a, a strong family educational culture. It matters whether you had breakfast this morning. It matters whether you had a good sleep, night of sleep last night or whether you were, you were up late because of gunshots in the alley. I mean, these are real issues we've got to know and address and understand and, 
and be aware of and, and manage to. But again, it's not an easy problem to solve. So there's one left, and it is a little bit easier problem to solve, and it's teacher engagement. If we can engage the teachers who are responsible for facilitating the learning process for the students and creating a, an engaging environment for them, if the teachers engage, that's going to trickle down to the students. And they're going to be, you know, now in the opposite's almost never true, right? I mean, if you're, if you're an actively disengaged teacher, how engaged are the students going to be? Not, I mean, almost not at all. So we know that relationships exist. And of those four things, we also know it's the easiest to manage to and, and really build on. So I'm going to wrap up with just a thought about, so how do we drive engagement in our schools? Many of you are the experts about how do you drive engagement in our schools. Traditionally, we focus on what's wrong with people. And thankfully, 15, 17 years ago, there were a group of psychologists, including Shane and, and a few others that we all know and love, that were getting together and thinking about what would happen if we studied what's right with people. You know, what would happen if we stopped focusing on what's wrong? Our, our daughter's five years old. She was born with a cleft lip. I love the fact that we had a surgeon that entered our life at just the right time, did his, his artistic magic, and, and that she has the most beautiful smile of any five-year-old you'll ever meet. It's necessary to, to remediate from time to time. It's not necessary to fixate on remediation for every single person we interact with. Let's start thinking about what's right with people and build on that. Instead of remediating what's wrong, let's think about growing what's right. And many of you have, have done a great job of that and are here because you want to do more of it. Here's the, here's the last data point I'll leave you with. When we ask students on our, on our Gallup student poll, is your school committed to building the strengths of each student? One to five scale, strongly disagree to strongly agree. If a student says, I strongly agree, my school is committed to building the strengths of each student, 79% are engaged in school. They're involved with and enthusiastic about. Now, maybe that's not perfect. There's still 21%. We need to figure out another way to engage them other than being a school that's committed to building strengths, but it sure feels like that's one of the, one of the necessary kind of raw materials to get us going there. So um, as we wrap up, this is a slide I borrowed from our friend Brandon from, from this morning, but when we think about the path to school success, if we're really about engaging students and preparing them for academic success and success in life, if that's where that arrow is pointing to, then let's start over here and think about, well, what are we doing with our leaders? What if every school district was, was led by a Josh Starr? What if every board of trustees had Rick Wagner on it? What, I mean, we've got some fabulous examples from today about what great leadership can look like. So let's get that part right. Then let's make sure they're put in a place where they're engaged on a regular basis at the local work group level so that they're engaged and then that trickles down and the students um, live in that engagement and really, and really move that forward. The, the Latin word for education is educe or to draw out of not to pour into. So why do we think everything about education is content expertise and how much can you retain? How about let's figure out what's inside, draw that out. What are those interests? What gives you joy? What are you, what are you excited about? What are your hot buttons? And then how can we create an educational culture, an educational future for you that helps you do more of what you do best? So a couple takeaways. So gallopstudentpoll.com is the website for our, our survey. Again, free. We made a 10-year commitment. I believe this is year four or five of that of that commitment, so you can sign up now and party on for the next five years free of charge. Um, so get your school district to do that. The, the field period is during the month of October. You can sign up now and, and um, get, the, get it on the school calendar and things. So we'd love to have you join us in that project. Um, would also love for you to think about um, how, what you can do personally to drive engagement in your work group. This is the Q12 survey is not a manager evaluation. It's not the manager's job to make sure you're all engaged. It's one of their jobs. They ought to be creating the conditions for that. But we each need to be owners about our own engagement and partners about that with our colleagues.